So I actually just recorded a whole video about um, sound devices and structure, but it was long, and so I wanted to give you as much as possible. So I just kind of left it where it was at the end. So I left it kind of how it was at the end, but one thing you can see is that I'm looking at structure devices, which you see down here. Um, I went through and just broke it down by sentences, which even in the paraphrase I couldn't do because we were try I was trying to make it work for you. But you can see that the very beginning, the first half of the poem, this is the first 11 lines. There's 21 lines in the poem, so roughly the first half are in two sentences that are long and complex and filled with lots and lots of imagery. The second half of the poem, the last nine lines, or ten lines, um, are short. This one, which is the most similar to the ones above it, because just because it has the deep, um, rich imagery of it, is the longest of three lines. But then you have one line, one line, two lines, two lines. So one, one, two, two. That's kind of interesting as it comes back to this idea of inextricable and separate, the idea of going back and becoming one. So one, one, two, two could maybe make sense. We talked about this phrase earlier as well, um, that it's a parenthetical expression. If you take it out, the sentence makes sense on its own. So it's not adding anything of content meaning so then what is it doing? And again, as we discussed, it's it's just contributing, in my opinion, to that imagery of the light as it goes through and almost some movement in the poem that you see here. Um, it also, when you read shorter sentences, the pace tends to speed up. And so I put here for the structure that the poem pace speeds up. I'm also going to add for structure, last four lines are one, one, two, two. Um, so possibly showing a connection or a joining of these big disparate ideas that separate and then combine into two thoughts. Um, if you have other ones, this is again, I'm, I'm modeling for you how I would do it. My brain works differently than all of yours and thank goodness for that. So if you, if I'm reading into something that you're like, oh, that's not what I see, Miss Hollingsworth, that's fine. Go with your own reading. Um, hopefully, especially with this one, some of you will see things that I'm not seeing. But if we're moving on to sound devices, so you guys are pretty good at this. As I went through the first, the first, um, I want to say stanza because it looks like stanzas now, but they're not. It's one big stanza. Um, and so maybe that's also for structure, that it's one big stanza despite all these different ideas. Um, uh, you notice a lot of sibilance, the frenzy of an old snake shedding its skin, the speckled road scored with ruts smelling of mold twisted on itself, oh, there's that, and re-entered the forest where the dashing leaves thicken and folk stories begin. So notice I didn't put the shh sounds because they're not sibilant, um, but here there's a lot, and particularly this line where he, he's listing three descriptions of the road, and they're parallel in that um, they all start with an adjective, speckled, scored, smelling, and all of them start with that hard S. Then he also throws in ruts. So it can even be a long S here. We have the speckled road scored with ruts smelling of mold. You don't even have to stop between these. If you can imagine like in music, a tie between the ruts smelling of mold. Road and mold. Every time I read it out loud, I notice that little internal slant rhyme or at least the O sound, the consonants. Um, so there's that. So here's a step away. We have learned some of the possible indications of sibilance, but a poet, just like a painter, can use any color. Green might be the color of jealousy. Um, green is the color of nature, but there's no reason a painter, uh, Van Gogh, for instance, when he painted his self-portrait, made it in kind of green shades. That was not him saying, well, because green means jealousy. Therefore, I am a jealous person. Or because green is a color in nature, I am one with nature. Some, sometimes there are other reasons and other connotations um, that an that artist is trying to convey with the tools that they use. So in this case, the S. Now, it does, it's a, not a coincidence. I'd imagine that there's a snake and then all this sibilance. But at the same time, it doesn't feel um, deceptive to me. Or is it? So we're going to really going to want to look at what does the S do in this poem, not just what do S's do in other works of literature that we've read. As we keep going, I notice sunset. So that's pretty clear. 
um, sibilants, you know, right there in one word coming right on the heels of these others. But then it says, would threaten us as we climbed closer to her house up the asphalt hill road. So it's definitely there. But these just seem to be words, not like this one, speckled, scored, smelling. Um, it, it seems a little bit more natural to me. We climbed closer to her house up the asphalt hill road. Um, and so while it's definitely still there, I'm not feeling like he's putting them in as close quarters as it was before. So it's almost like the sibilance continues, but isn't quite as emphasized as it was in this first part. The second line, I'm noticing a lot of old sounds climbed closer and boom. And I first noticed it because of the k, k sounds, the C's, the initial C's. But then the I also noticed the cl cl and then asphalt hill, wrangled, eyelids. And, and all this, I, I didn't start highlighting the L's really till I got here. Lucent as paper, lanterns, lamplight, glow. Just the same way when we were looking at light words. It's like, oh, dang, four light words in six words. That's a pretty clear indication. Lucent, lanterns, lamplight, glowed. And then the gl kind of mirrors the cl cl that we had up here. Lamp. So I'm noticing a lot of L sounds. And again, there are some things that L sounds might do. But we're going to have to say in this poem. What is it doing? Um, as I keep going, I see some L's, but I'm not noticing anything too extreme except for the leaves and libraries. Luck. Luck is always an interesting word. And so my my guess here, because I noticed the word luck previously, was like, wow, luck is a, is a strong connotation. Um, the fortune that was ours. Um, my guess would be that the L sound was a strong reason that it was left in. And also the K sound. It seems like there's a lot of juxtaposition of the k and oles together. Even leaves, libraries, Caribbean. <clears throat> um, gully, lamp, light. And, and I do think here at the end, there's a lot of L's here and they trickle through, but lamp, light, it's such a strong word. It's like, I almost want to read it with a spondy instead of it being, she was the lamp, light in the stair, where the emphasis is on lamp and then light is not stressed. Um, I almost want it to be, she was the lamplight. That these are two really important sounds and words that jump out. And then we end with indivisible twins. So, okay, so I'm noticing some L sounds culminating in lamplight. I'm noticing some sibilance. If I'm looking for rhyme, I, as I read it, I always heard this, oh, oh, I wouldn't necessarily call that rhyme. It's definitely consonants, but sure, maybe a little internal rhyme. There's, oh, skin and begin kind of interesting. It's a perfect rhyme. But gosh, when I read it, I didn't feel like there was any rhyme. In fact, road and mold were the only things that ever reached out to me when I was reading, but skin and begin. Um, and I guess there is a lot of siblings here. Closer, moss, vines, mimosa, lanterns, house. So the, the, there is a little bit of a continued sign, but I don't see too much except for then you have path and math. Boom. Aftermath. A big, perfect, I guess moss and house are kind of a slant rhyme. Um, but path and aftermath are definitely rhyming. And then you have tins and origins. And depending on how you read this word, it could be Caribbean tins, Caribbean origins. Voice and boys is a little slant rhyme as well that again plays with the sibilance. So I wasn't, I wasn't as hot on the sibilance, um, in my first reading and in my first recording that I made and deleted. But as I'm reading it now, I'm like, nope, the sibilance is pretty significant all the way throughout, and particularly at the ends of these lines um, in this stanza where you have the L's and the S's coming together, and you have it here as well. Shelves, voice, boys. And the rhyme seems uh, loose in that it's tying everything together, but you do have these two right here, math, path, and aftermath which seemed to be pretty important. Um, so I would say the rhyme increases towards the end. You have skin and begin. You really don't have a perfect rhyme here. Again, moss and house is a big slant, but then you have path and aftermath, tins, Caribbean, or Caribbean origins, voice, boys. Um, oh, tins, Caribbean, oh, twin, tins. Oh my gosh, you guys. Origins, twins. 
tins, origins, twins, with a little echo of it in Caribbean. So you get these pieces that, that come together. So maybe in providing some sort of unification because rhymed lines are unified. They are completely separate. They're their own thing. And yet when they're joined together, they're indivisible. You can't separate one line from its rhyme. Um, so that's where I would be, uh, and I might even put up here like tins, origins, twins, because tins and twins in particular are the best rhymes there. The skin and begin like a one syllable with a two syllable and path and aftermath where it's like, it almost doesn't seem like they rhyme. When I read it the first seven or eight times, I didn't notice the rhyme there. Um, because they're pronounced so differently. Path is emphasized, whereas aftermath, the af is emphasized. Um, it's a dactyl, so it's aftermath. Um, and then I was like, oh, tins and, and I say Caribbean, so I'm trying to, tins and origins, okay, fine. But again, different emphases on the syllables, and so, um, uh, but tins and twins is perfect. Voice and boys even is a little slanty, so it just kind of gets there. Um, and I don't know exactly if, if that makes sense in and of itself, or if it just matters that this harkens back to something earlier, um, it'd be worth spending a little bit more time on. So anyway, you could see that was 26 minutes of video. That was actually about 45 minutes to an hour of my time, really looking at each of these things in great detail, trying to make as many connections as possible. Um, in the first video, I really started to look at this unifying and going back, becoming one, this at one minute. Um, and I was open to finding other ideas as I looked at the structure of sound devices. But as typically happens when you're doing a poetry analysis, the more I found, the more it brought me back to this idea that it's going back, that it's reuniting, that it's unifying. And so that's going to put me on a good path towards my um, theme. So if we look here at attitude, now we have to think of like, what is the tone? So what is the speaker's attitude towards the subject? The subject would be this memory. It's not just Sedone. We don't even find out who she is till later. It's the, the story of the boys going to Sedone. Um, so I'm going to have you come up with a tone word. What do you think is her, if, is the speaker's attitude towards this experience. And you might come up with three or four adjectives to describe it because I do think there's some mixed emotions happening here. And then we look at the shift or shifts. Do we see anything, bringing this back to one poem, do we see anything that seems like a huge shift coming through? Um, so I've pointed out some ones that seem shifty to me. Um, so there's childhood, there's childhood's aftermath, just because it's that first sentence and it implies a shift here. There's this one thing and then there's this other thing. Um, but I don't think the poem itself shifts there. It's like this tells you there's going to be a shift. This is like the the stop ahead sign. Um, and, and so in here, we're going to want to find the shift somewhere a little bit later. We talked about this, this little offset of um, present tense voice. But is that the shift? So you're going to want to find like, where is the actual shift? And I'm going to argue that it's in the second half of the poem, that this is just a, a blinking yellow light saying, look for it. It's coming. And, um, we go back to the title, which isn't helpful because this is just a collection of 54 numbered poems. And this is the 14th one. And then you're going to write a theme statement. What is this about? And I'm going to tell you it's here, or at least my reading of it is here. If your reading is different, go for it. There is a, a small range of correct answers um, that need to be supported by your reading. Um, and so you're welcome to kind of use this or then to say, is this good? Is this bad? Is it painful? Is it, what is it? What's happening here? And then why? And the key is that the theme for this poem should be relevant to Derek Walcott who grew up in, you know, the 1930s, I think, in St. Lucia, and to you and me in Elk Grove, California today in 2021. All right, um, I'm here if you need me. Good luck, and I want to see this full TP cast from you um, when we have class on Tuesday.